everybody. Thank you for joining me here again today at Rewritten Vintage Homestead. I hope everyone's doing great. Uh, here in the Midwest, I had three days off of work last week uh, due to a snowstorm that we had. Um, currently, we have anywhere between, depends on what part of the Midwest you're in, but anywhere between 13 and 18 inches. Uh, today, the temperature is about 20, so it's cold. It's too cold to go outside and really do anything. But I tell you what, I've been so productive in my uh, snow days. I painted a bathroom, and I'm going to do uh, a video on that. I finished a quilt top, and I'm going to show you that in another video. And I've been trying out some new recipes, but today is Sunday, and I'm going to take it easy on this winter day and do what I love and I'm gonna plan my garden for next year. Um, my biggest supporter, <laughs> my biggest fan um, got a hold of me and said, you know, I, I really wanna put out a garden. I don't know where to start. I have no idea where to start. And if you go on the internet, there's so much information, it can be overwhelming. So Karen Sue, this video's for you. have to consider when you want to put out a garden or a garden area, grow your own food, is what I mentioned in our homesteading videos. Where do you live? What resources do you have? Um, do you have room to spread out or are you in a very small area in between buildings or do you have a patio? So assess your situation first and then you'll know which type of gardening will work best for you. And Sue's right, if you go on the internet, you're gonna find a plethora of uh, gardening information and they're gonna tell you that their way is the best. But really, they all need to be individualized to you. And I can guarantee you, I've tried every one of them. And there's even more coming out. So for example, and we'll talk about each of these so that it'll help you make a decision. But you have a kitchen garden or a cottage garden, a vegetable garden, back to Eden garden, permaculture garden. Um, they're coming out with something I'd never heard of before, which is a food forest garden. Um, and so it can be overwhelming. You have your three sisters gardening, your success, succession gardening, um, and you can pick one or you can choose to integrate all of them or several of them into whatever you're, you believe in, whatever you want to accomplish and whatever space you have. So let's talk about each of those individually. Marshall's getting his head rubbed, so he's enjoying this winter day. So the first garden we're going to talk about is the kitchen garden or a cottage garden. And what that is, is it's usually a raised garden. It could be in uh, long beds or it can be in containers. But typically, very close to your kitchen, so you can just go out the door, grab what you need um, in small harvests. So typically it's for uh, salads, spices, meals. So you're going to grab something real quick. You're going to use it in your meal. And the people who like this type of gardening are the ones who, who don't want to make a big commitment to a huge garden and all of that tilling and weeding. And they, But they are wanting to live a healthier lifestyle. 
So they want to be able to send their kids out or, the, or go out themselves and grab a tomato, a fresh tomato, fresh onions, fresh lettuce for their dinner salad. Okay, and, and cottage garden is about the same thing. It's, uh, it's more your raised beds close to the kitchen. Um, it's more of an English type of theme. So you may have some herbs uh, planted out that you can integrate into your salads and your soups and your dishes as well. A vegetable garden is a lot of square feet. It's usually further away from the house so that you can use more space. Um, a vegetable garden is for yield. So you want a lot, you want a lot of tomatoes, you want a lot of corn, you want a lot of beans, you want to freeze them, you want to preserve them, you want to can them, you want to share them, uh, but, but you want to build up your food supply so you need more room. It requires uh, thinking about how you're going to weed, if you're going to weed, uh, how you're going to take care of insects, how you're going to take care of invading plants, uh, how you're going to manage water. So a vegetable garden is a large operation where a kitchen or a cottage garden is close to the house, smaller, you don't till, um, and you can have a still have a healthy lifestyle. And that may be what you're looking for. Maybe you're not interested in growing your own vegetables, but you want to learn about herbs. Um, there's a lot of good information on the internet, but books too that help you identify herbs for cooking and drying that you can use in salves and you can use medicinally and you can use in candles and salads. And there are so many types of herbs that they're coming up with now, and then your heirloom herbs as well. Uh, so you can plant herbs in a bed, or you can put them in containers or even raised type of uh, beds. They can be invasive though. So herbs like to spread and they can, if you do incorporate them in your garden, they can take over as a ground cover. So, if you're just interested in, in coming up with your own tea blends, if, in adding them to salads, in uh, making lotions and, and bars and uh, homemade medicines, then herbs are for you. I love the concept of the Three Sisters Garden. Um, it, it stems from a long history of Native American uh, culture and gardening. The three most used uh, foods in their diet other than meat, which is corn, beans, and squash. And the idea is that the three sisters all work together to help each other. So typically you plant a strong plant first, such as a sunflower, which is actually considered the fourth sister, uh, or corn. So those are starting to develop and get taller and strong, okay? Now the corn provides oxygen to the soil. So if you've ever pulled up uh, corn or sunflower, you see that its roots spread far and wide. So it helps break up the soil and add oxygen. So one, once those start growing, then you're going to plant your beans. And so your beans you can use for long-term uh, food storage, and they add nitrogen to the soil. So see, everything is helping each other. As that corn grows tall, the beans can climb up the corn. And so it helps to stabilize them, and they depend on each other, okay? After your beans start taking root and going up the corn, that's when you plant your squash or your pumpkins, your squash. Um, and so the idea behind that is they, are, they typically stay low to the ground. They have larger leaves. And so the leaves will shade the ground and help against uh, weeds. And so they take care of each other and they're, you know, I, I love the idea of it. Um, However, 
I've tried this several times and, you know, every family has some that just don't get along. And I tell you, my sisters, my sisters don't get along. <laughs> so the problem I've always had with this, I love the idea though, is that typically one thing takes over the other and it's almost always my squash. My squash were crazy. I don't know if it's because of the oxygen and the nitrogen being so close together that they're just flourishing, but it ends up my squash starts climbing my <laughs> corn and my sunflowers too. And then they develop big uh, heads of pumpkins and squash that bring down my corn. <laughs> So I've had to kind of, you know, move away from that. And that's the thing about gardening is that you you learn. So there's probably something I'm not doing right that uh, I need to get a hold of a native el elder and have them straighten me out what I'm doing wrong. But uh, that's what Three Sisters Gardening is all about. Succession gardening is when you plant a crop and you let it take root and flourish and then you plant another crop or the same crop uh, so that they're coming ripe at different times. That way, let's say I know like with me in the month of August, it's crazy because I'm harvesting peppers and tomatoes and corn and everything all at once. So with this, if you do the corn first, any vegetable, tomatoes, First, you let them mature a little bit, then you plant your beans, you let them mature a little bit, then you plant something else so that you always have something coming ripe at a different time and you're not overwhelmed. Um, this would not work for me. Now, I do it, um, I do it kind of. So what I mean by that is once I have harvested my garden, and I've gotten most of what I can. Uh, I've dug my potatoes. I've dug, dug my sweet potatoes. So now I have all this room um, on one end of the garden. Then I will add something that I know will come up quickly and that I can harvest again. But I just get too antsy and itchy to get my garden in to plant one thing and then wait and then plant another. But it really does make sense so that you're not overwhelmed. And you can also... Keep an eye on things that uh, can't be planted until after the frost and things that can be planted before your last frost. And, and so you might have greater success with your garden. So how did Adam and Eve do it? <laughs> they had the most beautiful garden in the world. Uh, according to the Bible, where everything flourished and everything was delicious. And if you go out into nature and you go for a walk, um, you might see some wild carrots growing, wild onions growing, uh, a tomato that, that came from nowhere. And you're like, now, wait a minute, I busted my butt and here it is out here in the wild and mine's looking sickly. So that's where the idea of back to Eden comes from. And basically, Back to Eden tries to recreate um, the wild uh, nature with no tilling, uh, very little watering, um, no pest control as far as chemicals, just natural things. So um, people who usually do Back to Eden garden, they will till first. They may add a layer of um, newspaper or cardboard down that will disintegrate with time. Uh, they're gonna add some fertilizer of some kind, usually cow manure, some type of manure, layers of dirt, and then layers of straw. All of that will decompose and make a really, really nice, rich soil. Okay, then you plant your plants, you water them once, and you leave them to nature. So typically the only time you water is when you've had a drought and you see that your plants are, are under a lot of stress, then you'll go in and water. But you don't, you don't go back in and till again. You don't go pull weeds. Uh, you don't add chemicals if you see bugs eating your plants. 
You don't water once a week. You leave it to nature. I could never do this type of, of gardening. I see it all the time uh, on homesteading channels. And I'm sure it's easier. Uh, the, the initial work is not easy. Getting your bed ready. That, that takes some planning and some research and, and some manpower. But once you have that done and you have your plants in, you just leave it. So it would be easier. This would be something to think about if you have a job outside of the home and you don't have time to be out there weeding and constantly working in your garden. I like my garden to reflect my homestead. And so I like things that are aesthetically pleasing. So a weed would drive me crazy. Um, I like my rows nice and clean. I like everything pretty and working together. So to have weeds and, and ground cover that might be evasive popping up, I couldn't do it. So, But people have had great success with Back to Eden gardening, so this might be the choice for you as well. If you have a small area to work with, um, just a, a little sidewalk in your front yard or in your backyard or in between your garage and your house, you might want to consider container gardening. And depending on what plant you're, you're wanting to grow, such as a tomato would need a larger container than, let's say, lettuce would or even onions. Um, you can plant potatoes in large buckets. So if you don't have the time to weed and you don't have the area to till up and devote uh, a lot of space to, container gardening might work for you. Something you see a lot now uh, when you're trying to research gardening is permaculture. And it can be tricky to understand. And so I really feel like it can be suited to you. So what permaculture, the gist of it is, is it used to be permanent culture. So you were planting things uh, and you were trying to make sure that you were taking care of the earth and you were renewing the soil, you were feeding the soil and you were planting them in the best place pos possible uh, so you didn't erode the soil. You were able to water easily. Uh, they were getting sunlight naturally. But it kind of changed uh, the meaning uh, into a more hip kind of uh, definition to include all people, all nature, all insects, all natural life, working together and respecting each other and not harming each other. So permaculture is very aesthetic. Uh, you use a lot of your borders. You create uh, a beautiful uh, working environment. You may have like a pizza, a pizza grill outdoors. You may have a grilling area outdoors. You may have a swimming pool. So you're still doing your human things. But around those things, you're attracting bees, you're attracting butterflies, you're attracting uh, pollinators. You're encouraging natural um, natural bug killers like uh, ladybugs to kill aphids. And uh, you're encouraging root growth to add oxygen and nitrogen to your soil. You're keeping an eye out on your plants to make sure you're not eroding anything. So you're you're still living as a human, but you're observing your environment to make sure that that they are able to grow and flourish and you're not harming anything within your environment. Uh, you can take it a step further to where you're also helping other people. So a lot of people who do organic uh, or permaculture gardening uh, sell their, their food at uh, farmer's markets and share it with other people. So the main thing is, is you want to observe nature. Um, and are you attracting uh, animals that may need food?
food to your yard? Are you attracting insects that may help you with your bug control in your garden? Uh, are your plants getting the shade and the sun that they need naturally? But you're still able to uh, have your children out in the backyard and entertain without disrupting nature. So it's like I said in the beginning, all of these, if you, if you try to read on them or if you go on the internet, they can be very specific and you can get confused as to what you want to do. I feel like I am the closest to a vegetable garden that is done with the permaculture gardening in mind. So what I mean by that is that uh, I have a large area that I use for my vegetable garden. So it is away from the house so that I can spread out more. But I plant uh, flowers that are edible uh, that I also know will attract pollinators. And I have bee houses out there so that they're welcome. I have ladybug houses out there that will attract them because they're going to help me with my pest control. Um, I have water for butterflies and other nature birds. So I try to incorporate nature into my garden, but still produce a yield uh, that I can put away for my family in uh, times of leanness when I really need it. So you can have a container garden out in your garden, a uh, vegetable garden. You can add, if you don't want your herbs to be invasive, you can put your herbs in, in containers. So you can have an area for three sisters gardening away from your vegetable gardening. Um, something you need to remember is that you want to rotate your vegetables each year. So if you've planted uh, lettuce on this row this year and you've planted tomatoes here, then you want to rotate it the next year, okay? Because you need to add more minerals and uh, vitamins naturally to the earth um, that they won't be getting if you just continually plant the same type of plant in the same area. I think the, the lesson I want you to get from all of this is that not one type of gardening fits everyone. Um, gardening is individualized and you learn all the time. Uh, so I've learned a lot of lessons. And so I think I showed you this uh, in one of my very first videos. So when I started gardening, I created this little diary here and uh, I drew out my very first garden and what I planted where. Um, I would go through magazines and I would paste uh, pictures and recipes and lessons and how could I attract pollinators? How could I attract birds? And what did they enjoy? All of these things that I knew I wanted for my yard uh, how to make bee houses naturally with what I have here on the homestead. Um, how to harvest things that I, that I have here in my homestead, like walnuts. Uh, how to plant fruit trees. You're learning all the time. So you want to create a diary that is specific to you. Look around your area. What are your resources? What type of trees do you have? How much room do you have? Do you have a park across the street that you can forage at? We've talked about these things before, but you want to learn as much as you can about where you're at and what you can use. And so after I have uh, drawn out what my garden looked like that year, at the end of the season, then I go back and I make notes about what I want to change. So like I said, you're always learning. A bad, bad habit I have is <clears throat> I've said how aesthetically pleasing I love my garden to be. Well, that can be a problem. You need to plant plants and let them grow. Okay, you can't, you can't be moving them around. I don't think this looks pretty here, so I'm going to move it here. Or this is becoming too invasive right now, even though it's doing great. Uh, but I'm now I'm going to transplant it over here. 
So that was one lesson that took me a long time to learn is plan it and leave it alone, okay? You, uh, you want to keep things, if you're like me, you want to keep things weeded and pretty, but you have to let, let them get their roots deep into the earth and flourish. You can't, it's not like a house. You can't be rearranging your house, but make a note of it that you want to do something different the next year. Uh, something that I also learned, I told you about my three sisters gardening that I learned from. Um, another thing is, <clears throat> for some reason, I don't know why I did this one year, but I planted larger plants going down the middle of my garden. So I had my tomatoes going down the middle, uh, and then I may have carrots, and then I may have peas and, and that type of thing to the right and to the left. Uh, and then I would have a big row of peppers and then a smaller thing of lettuce or whatnot. What I learned from that was my smaller plants weren't getting any sun because my large plants were shading them. So you learn as you go. So you want to think about that when you're planting your garden. You want your tall things on one end um, or spread out and your smaller things where they can still get the sun and the water they need and not have to compete. With, with other things for sun and water. So I learned that too. Um, out here in the country, I have trouble with moles and um, we've tried everything. We've tried traps, we've tried smoke bombs, we've tried vibration. Uh, we've tried to flush them out with water. You know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's cruel and, and that I don't like. <laughs> I've been doing a lot of reading on that, and apparently marigolds, they don't like the smell of, and so they'll stay away. So this year, I'm going to make sure that all around my garden are marigolds, and not just in a row, like I typically do. They're going to go around the border uh, to see if that will help. I'm also going to dig a little deeper around the outside of my gardens and put uh, a barrier of some kind you know, that they'll knock into and not be able to go further into my garden that way. So lay out, get a piece of paper. What do you want to grow? How much room do you have? Where will you put this? Where's the sun in your yard? Where's your water hose? Um, do you have water drainage? Now's the time to think about all of that stuff and drain while you're stuck in the house and you can't get out and draw it out. I want my sunflowers here. I want my tomatoes here. I'm going to put potatoes here. Um, that's another lesson I learned with my sweet potatoes and my potatoes. I had great harvest, but it was hell trying to get them out of the, out of the ground <laughs> for an old lady. So this year I'm going to sop that baby up with sand so that they're easier for me to dig. So nothing is a failure. You're always, always learning, okay? And pick what works for you. Um, so, you guys, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope it was helpful. Um, Sue, I hope it was really helpful for you. You're welcome to borrow my seed catalogs anytime you want, and we can play, sit down and play in your garden anytime you'd like as well because I guarantee you nothing will bring you more joy. I want to show you uh, the picture that I have on the front of my little garden diary here. I don't know who the artist was, but they captured me in one photo. So the girl here is dreaming about everything growing above her and her hair takes root. And I don't know, that's just me. <laughs> you guys, something I want you to think about here. This is um, African American History Month, the month of February. But what would Frederick Douglass, Martin Luther King, Abraham Lincoln, Chief Joseph, four very different people, what do they have in common throughout history, do you think? I want you to think, of, think about it, and we'll talk about that in our next video. You guys, I hope you have a great week. I hope you're enjoying your winter. Now's the time to be doing stuff inside. If you have things to do inside, learn a new recipe, uh, get some exercise, redecorate a room, 
uh, read your books, plan your garden, do what needs to be done because spring will be here before you know it. Thanks for joining me. If you haven't already, please subscribe, recommend your friends, leave a comment. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you.